All right, good morning, everyone. So this is the last lecture next week. Uh, however, the, the, they have scheduled the evaluation, the course evaluation. So it would be excellent if you all can make it. Uh, again, it's going to be at 8 o'clock. It's probably going to take 10 minutes. And then you can go home afterwards or stay around and ask me if you have any questions about the project. If you haven't started your project yet, you're a little bit late because the project, it's a big uh, a portion of the course, so you really need to have thought about what the project should be, what's the outline, what is the objective, and all that. The how I'm going to create that project, I will look at what is the model that you actually prepared, uh, does it have a, is there an objective to it, how complex it is, and uh, what, what's more important is how you presented all this. The presentation of your project is a very important aspect of the project. Your, your PowerPoint presentation or whatever form of presentation you're going to uh, uh, give and the project report. How you write the project report, the structure of how you're presenting what you did is very important. It's not simply you did the most complex model but you're not able to communicate what you did that doesn't mean you're going to get the full mark. So you have to you have to prepare a good model, and you also have to be able to communicate that model. Some people, I mean, we shouldn't be giving them good marks, but they're very good at communicating stuff that is not very good. But <laughs> but but they still get a good mark for the communication because uh, I mean, it, at least the, the, well. How can I say that while being politically correct? <laughs> so, so communication is a key aspect, basically. If you're a very good communicator, you're very good at communicating your technical work, then you, get a, you, you, good, you, you will get a good mark for that communication. That's the best way of saying it. So, so today we're going to talk about uh, two things. Just quickly talk about large uh, or non-linear elastic materials, and then we're going to talk about uh, contact. And I will show you three different models. One of them is your assignment. I will just go through th th three different um, tutorials on how to model contact in apps. So so far we have studied linear elastic materials. We've gone in details on how to model linear elastic materials and the theory behind modeling linear elastic materials in uh, finite element, using finite element analysis. Then we presented the plasticity, but we didn't really go through the theory, how the software calculates the strains or the stresses, but we went into details on how to model something like this, or how to, how to be just users of the software. And Today we're also going to show you how to be users of the software or of any finite element analysis software that utilizes uh, large elastic uh, deformation materials. So large elastic deformation materials are materials that exhibit really large deformations such as rubber, such as a lot of biological material, and these materials exhibit uh, a relationship between the stress and the strain that at large deformations is no longer linear. So you can have a, a, if this is a measure of the stress, and lambda 1 is a measure of the strain, which is basically the, the length divided by L, the initial uh, length, which in terms of what we call the strain, epsilon 1, which is delta over L0, which is L minus L0 over L0, this will be equal to 1 plus epsilon 1, 1. And so the stress corresponding to 1 is equal to 0. And most of these materials exhibit the same behavior under small deformations when the strain is small. But as the strain increases, you might get, uh, depending on the material, you will get maybe linear elastic or nonlinear and you can get any kind of any nonlinear uh, response. 
And there's many materials that, according to what type of material you have, there are many material models that exhibit, uh, that will let you model a material that deforms in such a manner. In general, these materials are not function, that the relationship between the stress and the strain is not function of, uh, or, or the relationship is not given as function between the stresses and the strains, it's given as functions between the stresses and what we call the principal stresses. In linear, elastic, Material. The stresses are functions of the strains, which are epsilon one, one and so on. Enlarged deformation. Elastic materials. The stresses are functions of the principal stretches, which are what we call lambda one, lambda two, lambda three. What these are, lambda 1 is equal to 1 plus epsilon, let's call it 2, 1, lambda 2 is equal to 1 plus epsilon 2, lambda 3 is equal to 1 plus epsilon 3, or let's not use the string. Delta 1 over L1, not delta 2 over L2 naught, delta 3 over L3 naught, where if I have a Q with then L01, L02, L03, and this cube deforms and exhibits very large rotations and very This becomes L2, L1, L3. Lambda 1 is equal to L1 over L01, which is equal to 1 plus the change in length of 1 divided by L. And so on. And so the stresses are functions of these stretches, and these stretches are calculated in a very, uh, you're taking 664. You've already seen that it's not a, a simple task to calculate these stretches. Uh, but for large deformation materials, this is how uh, the relationship is described. So if you ever need these materials, for example, you're, you're doing your uh, you're modeling a rubber material and your supervisor told you you have to use large or hyper elastic materials you already have a lot of uh, different models that you can use for example you have, if you're using abacus you've got the Mooney Ridley material model New Hookian material model, the Ogden material model the polynomial form material model all these material models come with uh, or require certain material constants similar to Young's Mollus and Poisson's ratio. These material constants are obtained from, of course, experiments. Or if you already know how this material exhibits, uh, how this material deforms in a small deformation, uh, uh, under small deformation, so if you know how this material deforms elastically, uh, I mean, uh, at small deformations, if I know Young's Mollus and Poisson's ratio, for this material under small deformation, I can have some estimate, or I can get start with some estimate for these material constants. And usually, these uh, material models they start with the with what we call the strain energy. The strain energy is function of these principal stretches that we talked about. Lambda 1, Lambda 2, and Lambda 3. 
and the energy is decomposed into two portions. One, the energy due to the volumetric strain or volumetric deformation. where j here is equal to lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3. And so the volume will change only with lambda 2, lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3, the product is not equal to 1. If the product is equal to 1, then the volume is equal to 1. And so you don't have any energy contribution due to vol uh, volumetric change. These other uh, parts are due to shape change. And they're also a function of these different stretches. And so under small deformations, this constant is related to the bulk modulus of the material. And these constants are related to the shear modulus of the material. So D1 is related to the bulk modulus by this uh, relationship. And C10 plus C01 are equal to the shear modulus according to this relationship. Any Hookian material will have C10 and only D1, so only two constants. If you were trying to estimate those two constants, this one again is related to the bulk modulus, and this one is related to the shear modulus. More complicated materials, the, the higher the terms, the higher the nonlinearity that you can model using these materials. For example, if you have a material that exhibits stress strain curve that does something like this, you might be able to model it with a different uh, uh, with different materials. And again, this part will give you the bulk modulus and this part will give you or is related to the shear modulus. And same with the polynomial for material. And in your assignment, we're going to, because we're doing a very large deformation material, when, when we were doing very large deformations, the linear elastic uh, material model will, would not be able to converge. And so under large deformations, when you have a really rubbery object that, that uh, exhibits very large deformations, you have to use one of these models. So I will show you uh, where to choose the option and uh, how to model something. Uh, something like this. Okay, so the next thing we want to talk about is modeling contact. So to model contact, we need to define two types of behavior. tangential behavior and the normal behavior. Now there are many options for the tangential behavior, but the first, which is what, or the two uh, behaviors that you're most probably interested in are frictionless if there's no coefficient of friction which means at the contact there's no stresses developed in the tangential uh, uh, between uh, in the tangential uh, direction or tangent to any two surfaces or you have uh, coefficient friction Also tell the software that it's a rough surface, which means once they are in contact, they don't slide. Or you can even define the maximum shear stress. All of these are possibilities. What I'm interested in is one and two. For more involved applications, you might 
want to be looking at number four as well. If you're you have molding a certain uh, uh, material that acts as a bond between two surfaces, and you know the maximum shear stress, you might try to input the maximum shear stress and see the behavior. But usually these things are very brittle, and so you have to be very careful because if you if you model something, if you model a, a block. and you're trying to push it with a P, and you define the maximum shear stress. Once you reach that maximum shear stress, that block wants to, uh, to run, there's no resistance. And so because there's no resistance, the, the model will stop. Because it, it will just slide over. So when you, when you use something like this, you have to be very careful when the material actually reaches this maximum shear stress, because you won't, you, the, the, the software will stop. Okay, so this is the first behavior that you need to define is the tangential behavior. The other one is normal behavior. So in the normal behavior, if I call this this is U, and if this is the negative U, and this is the positive U. then there are different models that tell me something about the contact force and that distance u. The default model, which makes, uh, which, makes uh, which should be used in most of the applications, is the hard contact. Hard contact means when U is negative, the force of contact is zero. Once the snow touches the surface, that's when you start developing force. And this force will depend on equilibrium. And so you have this uh, curve that relates that distance U with the force of, uh, with the contact force. So you only have contact force as uh, when the U is zero. U is not zero, you have zero contact force, and U can never be positive. So this is what we call the hard contact, and that's, it works well, really well for most applications. But for some applications, this hard contact is, you might not achieve convergence because of this Because of this point, it's a really very, uh, it's, a, it's a point of per perhaps instability or numerical instability. You have a, a horizontal curve and a, and a vertical curve, and so there's there's a more, uh, if you don't achieve convergence, if you try many things and you're not able to achieve convergence uh, in contact, you can use what is referred to as softened contact. And in softened contact, you allow a little bit of penetration. So this curve, or, or this relationship, would look something like this. Now, how would materials behave? I doubt that they're behaving in a hard contact, or they probably, when you get two objects, together, they probably start, uh, because of how rough the surfaces are, it depends on how smooth and rough surfaces are, but they probably start feeling that they're in contact when there's a very small distance in between them, that's when they start transmitting forces, and the relationship is not, there's a little bit of maybe penetration at some point, no penetration, at the so if you're looking at a rough surface like this and another rough surface like this. So they start feeling contact when there's an, an initial uh, displacement and then there's a little bit of penetration between both because you're assuming that this surface is this and this surface is that. So so the, the soft end contact just tries to overcome the numerical instabilities by giving by 
modeling the relationship as in a nonlinear form. And there are many ways by which you can input that curve into the software. The important thing is, from a practical point of view, or from a, new, a, a, a model point of view, that these distances, V1 and V2, at a really high force, these are, of course, you choose those numbers because you make up that curve. The important thing is that those distances at the maximum force of, of, that's transmitted across the surface and the distance at which the two surfaces start transmitting uh, forces, these two, surf these two, V1 and V2, have to be much smaller than the element size. So if this is your element, I would make sure that V1 and V2 are about 10% or no more than 10% of element size. Because if they're more than 10% of you, they're starting to penetrate uh, more than, than really that the results of that element are not really uh, reliable. So I'll give you a very good example where I had to use that soft and contact. Um, <coughs> so the, to, in my in an application that I had to use soft and contact, I had E was very small, and Poisson's ratio was almost 0.5. And so. The material is, is, is very soft, but at the same time, it's uh, incompressible. It's very soft, but incompressible, and so there was a lot of deformations uh, on the surface. And so I had to use uh, the soft and contact. But of course, it, each application is different, but in this particular application, I had to use soft and contact to make the uh, contact work. And not only this, uh, something else about the master and sleep I will talk about in, in a second. So how does the software, how does the software model contact? And I think that applies to both ANSYS and Abacus. The software model contacts using the concept of master surface and slave surface. So you have a master surface, or you designate one of your two surfaces as master. And the other one is designated as slave. And what the software does, it ensures, it checks the nodes of the slave surface against the master surface. If this red is here, then it brings it back. If this red node is inside here, during, during one of the iterations, it brings it back. Once this is inside, it brings it back and makes it slide on that line. Or whatever, if this is nonlinear, makes it slide on that nonlinear line. As you can see, this is the, the idea of master and slave ensures that one surface does not penetrate the other, but does not check the other, does not check whether the master slave, uh, master surface penetrated or not the, uh, the the other surface. So you might get a penetration from the master into the slave. So the, 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 you have to be careful which surface to designate as your master and which surface to designate your state. Now I had a, a, 
lots of uh, discussion with Fatima, she does not agree with everything I say, that's fine. It's up to you to, <laughs> to decide. As long as it works and there's, no, there's not a lot of penetration, then it's fine. So, the master surface usually You should choose the master surface as the more rigid and or uh, and also the less or the coarser mesh. So, otherwise, so let's say you have a coarse this is the sleeve this is the master then what would happen is you might get so this node will not penetrate this node will not penetrate but you will get the master slave the master surface will We'll probably do something like that, or even because we're only checking that the slave does not penetrate the master, and because of the coarseness of the slave, the master will penetrate the slave surface. This is a counter example. So penetration occurs. If master surface is or has a finer mesh. So, you also have the option in Abacus to designate each one a master and each one is a slave in the same contact. You can say, check both. But when you say check both, you might also get into some numerical uh, issues because of the coarseness of the mesh. Especially if you're using linear elements. So, when I designate both a master and a slave, in one iteration the software will check, oh, this is in contact, and this is very close contact, there's no force here, but let's say iteration, let's say this, during this iteration the, the convergence has not been achieved, or the external force is not equal to the internal forces, in the next iteration this might be in contact and this one is not, so the software will, will, will be uh, iterating around the equilibrium, but because of it's checking both, you might not actually achieve the convergence, and that's in this case, again, if, if you have a very uh, so the two surfaces, the, the, the core, the, because of the meshness of the because of the coarseness of the mesh, in this case, it might be beneficial to use the softened contact because if you use the softened contact, both this node and this node will be transmitting force. And that kind of creates, it dampens the numerical irregularity, the, the numerical instabilities that you 
might get into. So, in the next uh, little while, I'm going to show you three different models. So, model one. Axisymmetric. Rigid. Indenter. With an analytical surface. So an indenter like this. Indenting an object and we're modeling it using axisymmetry, so I'm only gonna, uh, going to model a one cross section. And number two, axisymmetric rigid indenture with a discrete rigid surface to explain the difference. Finally, I'm going to model what you have to do for your assignment where you have two rigid cylinders and you have a, a, a hyperelastic large deformation ball that you're trying to squeeze in between those two. Now in the last model, I'm going to show you a few things that you're going to have to use to make this happen. And the one thing you need to, uh, one of the things you need to know is, of course, you're going to use symmetry, and before I tell you how symmetric or where are the planes of symmetry, just think about it for one minute and think about how you would model this, because I'm going to solve it for you right now, but I just want you to think about it before I tell you how to do it. So think about where are the planes of the symmetry and how you would consider which portion what's the smallest portion of this model that you can use so perhaps just draw it throw out which portion you would include So to use symmetry here, actually I'm going to, so here are the two cylinders and here is the ball. First plane of symmetry is that one. And the second plane of symmetry is, now I'm going to look from the side, so here is the cylinder, here is the ball. And here's the second plane of symmetry. And there are a few things that you, a few techniques that you will need to do for this to work. And I will show you this at the end of that lecture. Do you guys have any questions before we start Abacus? And if you need a more comprehensive <coughs> Understanding of the master and the slave, talk to father. <coughs> 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 yes. 
So, so this is how the end result should look like, but I, uh, I cheated here and I, I wanted to show you. Uh, so it looks like it penetrated, it, it's going through, but I actually made a, uh, when I define the contact, I only define the contact between the bottom and that cylinder, and because I define the contact between the bottom part of the ball and the cylinder, you ended up with this penetration because the software is not checking this against anything and so that's why it did not go through all the way now you need to apply the pressure in a way so that this goes all the way through now of course once it goes all the way through the pressure starts decreasing the pressure required to push starts decreasing because the pressure starts decreasing you have to use the the, the Riggs method. If you don't use the Riggs method, the moment the pressure reaches its maximum, you won't be able to push more and the, the software will stop. So let's look at the, the, the first model. So, first I'm going to define an axisymmetric rigid surface. The difference between a discrete and an elliptical rigid the discrete surface is a surface that I'm going to put some rigid elements on it, and an elliptical uh, rigid is a surface that just is defined by an equation. So if you have a, a cylinder, it's defined by an equation, so I don't need to discretize it. But if you have a, a more a rigid surface that has a more that cannot be described by an equation, you would use a discrete rigid. And I'll show you now the difference in the results if I use a discrete rigid and analytical rigid. So I'm going to start with an analytical rigid surface. Very fast, as you can see. <laughs> So, once you define a rigid surface, you have to designate one point as a reference point to that rigid surface. This reference point, the unknowns are the six degrees of freedom of that reference point. 
So every point on that rigid surface is controlled by the degree, by the six degrees of freedom on the rigid uh, point of that rigid surface. The second part is a is a deformable object. Create a section, assign a section, mesh the second part. Now I'm gonna, uh, I, I need a more uh, fine mesh, especially at the contact. Mesh part, all right, bring them both in. from here move the bottom surface from this point to okay. so contact, you want to get these as close as possible before you start doing any, uh, applying any forces. Now, you, in contact too, you actually would like, usually you would like to stabilize the model because that rigid surface is, is unstable. So, um, you want to apply a force on that rigid surface and you want to make the, the, the reaction to that surface is only established once they are in contact. But if they're not in contact and you apply a force, the, 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 the model is not stable and the software will not find the solution because it might not, it might not find the, the reaction in, in that step. And so what I'm going to do now is show you what will happen if I don't really properly get them in contact. So first I'm going to measure the distance between this node and this node. It's 18.8 whatever units I'm using. So 18.8. So what I will do is create a step one. And in one step, I'm going to apply the boundary conditions of first symmetry, the rigid point, and the surface are symmetric around the X. The second boundary condition is, let's say the bottom surface is not, is restrained from moving upwards. And so everything is, in, is stable except this rigid surface moving up and down. So I'm going to first apply the displacement to this rigid point, U2 of negative 18.8, which should bring it down to just barely in contact. And then I'm going to, I'm going to create another step. And that's say point one, and the maximum is point one. I just in increments of point one, the the, the, the the time increments when the time period is one. So ten percent of the load in each uh, load increment. And in this step, I'm going to take that boundary condition, and I'm going to deactivate it. And instead, I'm going to apply a load 
which is a, a force on the rigid point of negative 200. So bring them in contact and then apply a force. Now let's see what will happen. Right, I haven't defined any contact yet. So to define the contact, first you define the property. And in the property you have to define both. So the tangential behavior, let's give it, you can, there's the rough, you can use the Lagrange multipliers or the penalty to define the coefficient of friction. And let's give it 0.3, coefficient of friction of 0.3. And for more involved applications, you should look at the shear stress or the elastic slip. But for me, all I'm interested in is just the coefficient of friction of 0.3. And the normal behavior is the default hard contact and allow separation after, uh, after contact. So I defined the interaction property. I now I'm going to define the surface to surface contact. The master slave, the master surface is this. And as usual, the software is going to ask because it's a shell or it's a wire in this case. Do you want which one is actually the contact surface? It's the yellow. And this, the slave surface is this one. And if you look closely here, sometimes if the two surfaces are very close to each other, you might want to adjust or specify tolerances by which the software would bring the two surfaces, uh, would move the nodes so that they were actually starting contact. And if you have a little bit of overclosure, 0 0.001 millimeter, the software would move that without any force. Just adjust the initial geometry to get the two surfaces in contact. So we just, we don't need adjustments, they are far from each other. You can also define small sliding or finite sliding. Small sliding is similar to rough, where there's no not a lot of sliding, but we're just doing finite uh, sliding application where I'm, I would like them to slide on top of each other as much as they want. And the interaction property that I defined, I can choose it here. If I have different surfaces, I can define as many interaction properties as I want. So I've defined the contact, everything is set. I'm going to run the model. And the first warning, you have two unconnected regions in the model, which is it's, it's just fine. We, we started with two unconnected regions. So it actually solved, but last I, last night it did not solve for me, but that's fine. So in the first step, it worked, it brought them together. But it shouldn't have worked. Let's see. Let's see what happened. So let's see what happened in the first step. So in the first step, they, they're just about to be in contact. And in general, I mean, it depends. It sometimes works and sometimes doesn't. But because I applied the right force, when there's no stress right now, there's, they're not in contact, you might not be able to achieve equilibrium. But the software was able actually to find the contact in the next step, so it worked. So now, what we used was an analytical rig. Now I'm going to go to the view, ODB display options, and the refinement level X refine to show you what that means. We actually used an analytical region. We defined this as a cylinder, and that's why you actually see 
that these there's a little bit of penetration, but I'm, I I doubt that this is real. But you can see that for an, an, an analytical version, I actually maintained the curved surface. Because it's an, an, an analytical rigid surface, so I maintain that rigid surface, uh, or I maintain that the, the, the curvature of that setting. Now, if I repeat this, and instead of an analytical rigid, I will define. So I'm going to delete this. Define an analytical, sorry, a discrete, a, a, a discrete rigid, and show you the difference. Now, because this is discrete, I have to mesh it. And I choose to mesh it with a coarse mesh. So instead of eighteen point eight, I'm going to put ten point instead of one zero nine, just to maybe maybe it'll give me the problem that I'm talking about right now. Apply to this rigid point. Ten point zero nine. And in the second. interaction as well, I have to properly define it. I changed the master surface, so the master surface is this one now. It's discrete rigid rather than analytical rigid. Now submit. You see that in the second, it was not able to solve the second uh, step. And if you look at the message file, first step worked well, it moved down 10.09. In the second step, each you'll see here the warning is solver problem, numerical singularity when processing node part three, degree of freedom two. That's the node where we're trying to apply a vertical load. The, 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 the ball is not stable and it has not established contact yet. There's 0 0.01 millimeter different or whatever, like they're very, very close. But the, the software is not able to find that just moving it down that slight distance is enough to stabilize the ball. And so it, it tries with various levels of forces and you always get the same problem and so you're not able to achieve and so I'm going to go back to step one
that instead of making it 10.09, I will make it back to 10.1, and hopefully that will solve it. And it does solve it. But you can see here that now the, 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 the deformation follows the discretization, discretization of the, the ODB, the, the, the discretization of the rigid surface. So because I have made the rigid surface into elements, you can see that this is this follows the first element and this follows the second element. So there's a difference between a discretized rigid surface and an elliptical rigid surface. A discretized rigid surface, I'm just making it out of a bunch of planes, out of a bunch of planes, so that the 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 the, the slave surface is just following those planes. An analytical rigid surface, I'm just defining a certain equation by which those nodes are following that equation. So depending on your application, you will choose whichever you want as your uh, whichever would fit your application. So let's now uh, look at your assignment. So I'm going to start the model. And the first is a 3D. Let's define the cylinder. And you can define the cylinder in many different ways. And I'm going just to define it using an analytical rigid by revolving uh, a line so this is the cylinder I'm going to fix it in space. I fixed it to a rigid point. The second part is a 3D deformable uh, solid. I'm going to revolve a, a half a, a, a circle. Now I'm going to apply the pressure on the upper half of the of that ball. So I'm going to apply pressure on the upper half. So I have to create a partition. So to create a partition, I'm going to define a plane. X Z plane. So I'm going to partition this into two parts so that I can apply this, the, the load only on the upper part. So I'm going to partition all these faces using that plane. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I selected partition uh, faces using datum plane. So this, these are the faces using the datum plane. Create partition. And now I've created partition so I can apply the load only on the upper half. I'm going to mesh this ball. I'm going to use it using tetra. Here we mesh, non-linear. quadratic tetra mesh let's make it two 
and mesh it. So this is the, 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 the ball that I want to penetrate the cylinder. I need to define a material. Elasticity. This is hyper-elastic material. There are different. The strain energy potential, you can have any of the strain energy uh, functions that we talked about. Uh, I would recommend using either the Mooney Rivlin or the Neo Hokian. So I'm going to choose the uh, Mooney Rivlin and the, co the coefficients C10, C01, and D1. So I'm going to make this. So in your assignment, you have to write what you chose. If you chose a certain values, whatever these values, you have to justify why you chose those values or what numbers, what is the corresponding and smallest and Poisson's ratio. So if you choose certain Poisson's ratio or certain, certain uh, young smallest and that translates into C10 and C01, you have to say what numbers you choose and you also have to say, I'm letting it free, but you have to tell me what diameter of, for the ball you choose, what the distance is between the two cylinders is and what the diameter of each cylinder is. Because I and, and that's why I don't want, even if you're helping each other, each person should have a different number from the other. Okay? Unless you really think like each other. <laughs> so hyperelastic material. And if things don't work, the, the best thing is to actually change the material properties of your hyperelastic material until things work. I mean, you have to read the message file first. But this one hopefully will work right away. Now I need to rotate the ball to put it in, uh, in the right spot. So rotate around this 90 degrees. And then I need to rotate another 90 degrees. And of course, you. Th th this is a very small distance, so it would be very tough to actually penetrate or to pass this through. And so you have to be. Yeah, you have to help yourself by choosing a nice distance. So I'm going to move it in the x direction. It should work. All right, so everything is in, uh, in place in the right spots. I'm going to create two steps. In the first step, I want to get them in contact. Now, I don't really have. Uh, I don't really have to know how much I should move this down, but I'm. I'm going to try to um, estimate. The 
vertical distance between this point and this point. The vertical distance is about 38. It knows that in the z direction it's about 13.75. Oh, well, these are sorry, yeah. The vertical distance is about 13.75, so I'm going to move it about 13.75 downwards first before trying to apply force. Okay, so the first step in the first step I'm going to fix the cylinder what's going to be fixed for the whole duration I'm going, of course, the symmetry this and this is symmetric around Y. <coughs> this surface and the surface are symmetric around Z, around X. And then in the third, take that top surface and move it down negative 14 millimeters and let's see what happens did I say negative or positive? yes I said negative but negative is upwards so this is positive 14 So this is the first step, or let's see what happens. So if I forgot to define the interaction. Again, interaction properties, contact, tangential. Let's make it uh, uh, with Lagrange multipliers over penalty, coefficient of friction 0.3. And the normal behavior is that is the hard contact. And define the interaction between the two surfaces. This is the master surface. The purple, uh, sorry, the brown. And don't forget to define both as your master surface, as your uh, slave surfaces. Submit. So let's assume that it worked and you got them in contact. After you did that, then you create your second step. The second step is static rigs because we don't know the, how much pressure we actually need. And in the second step, I'm going to suppress the last boundary condition of displacement. surface and we're just going to apply a random large pressure 500 and then run it now if you have a, an old computer I would recommend that you use your friend's computer <laughs> because it will take some time and be doing another assignment as well because it might be taking some time to do the analysis so you can do something else other than just wait for it because you might be waiting for a long time <coughs> so 
So we'll just wait here just for the first step if, to see if it works or not. And then we'll set it free. And so the analysis has completed successfully in the first step. Let's see the results. So because of the way I uh, drew the surface, the rigid surface, you might it, it's not visible here. So I'm going to go to the ODB display options. And sweep analytical rigid surfaces. Surfaces, the, the software, you, you have to tell the viewer to view them or to actually yeah to actually do the, the sweeping. Otherwise, if you define it using a discrete rigid, you don't have to do it, it, the elements will already appear. And the deformation, oh, the displacement that I applied already got them in contact, so it's fine. The problem is I made sure that, that the reason why I don't want you to apply displacement is because the way I apply displacement, I forced all the nodes to go through the same displacement but we want to apply constant pressure rather than the same displacement. These are two different boundary conditions. We're just using a constant pressure to push this ball down through this. So this works fine. So far we got them in contact, we got them maybe too much in contact, but that's fine. Then you start applying the pressure and you push the ball through. And uh, then at the end you, you, you want to see that the pressure decreases as you are push as you push the ball through because as you push the ball through the pressure when, you, when you're doing a static Ricks method you will see that the uh, load proportionality factor delta load proportionality factor is becoming negative which means that the loads are starting to decrease with respect to the previous so you get a, a an increasing pressure and then after it's started to go through the, the pressure will decrease so I probably asked you I don't remember exactly what I asked for, but you probably will need to draw the relationship between that pressure and the displacement of one of the nodes. Yes. Right now, there's still only high pressure. And right now, right now, this is displacement. I know, but because it's the contact between the ball and the cylinder, we we need to have the pressure, something like that. I I know you you put only displacement, but uh, since they are the surfaces in contact, they need to be something other, like the pressure from the cylinder. I, I know you, you, uh, you define the displacement and the vertical displacement, but yeah, like that, I don't know. So, so, so in the first step, you get them in contact using the displacement because you have control over the displacement. With the displacement, you can get them in contact, but, but if you can get the corresponding when you apply displacement, you get a reaction. Yeah. So you have, you are applying basically pressure through applying displacement, but you just you're con you're controlling the displacement rather than the force. So they're equivalent. The, the question is, what is it for this particular situation? What is the what a, what is it that I'm asking for? I'm asking for a, a constant pressure, not a constant displacement. And so initially you. I'm just getting them in contact using a displacement, a constant displacement. Then after that, in the next step, I'm removing that displacement, that I'm deactivating the boundary condition, and I'm applying pressure instead. So, in the model here, in the first step, I applied that displacement, and in step two, I deactivated that displacement and applied the pressure. I just ran the first step by itself just to make sure that it did what I wanted it to do. But then I can now run this and hopefully it will go through. Does this answer your question? All right, so this is what you have to do for your assignment. This is the last assignment that, that you need to do.
for this course, again, you, sh you should have started your project or at least thought about starting the project. Next week, we are only meeting for 10 minutes. But then after that, if you have any questions about your project, I will be here for the next, for the three hours afterwards. And we can talk about the, your particular project. Your final exam will be the lecture after that. I'll set just like last week, or like, like your midterm, I'll probably give it to you on, fri on Friday. Is this what I did last time? What Thursday. Did Thursday. You on yeah. Thursday? Yeah. Okay, well, I'll give it to you on Thursday then, and you just bring it to me on uh, Monday morning, or email it to me, or pass it underneath my door, or however you want to give it. Uh, you want to. I, I might have it only. Well, that's that's all the same. Okay, so the same same thing. I will give it to you on Thursday night, and I will expect it. Uh, Monday morning. And expect anything. I might ask you to do things in Abacus. I might ask you to research something on, on, on finite element analysis that I haven't talked about. And of course, a lot of nonlinear stuff as well. But you have enough time to uh, ask me. No, I'm not. I mean, depending on the questions. Ask <laughs> the internet. <laughs> 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 We're getting good term this Thursday. What midterm? We're talking about the final exam. Oh, final. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I mean. No, not this Thursday. That's the last. Not this Thursday. This, no, not this coming Thursday. The Thursday after. So two weeks from now. Okay. And we already set the date for... Final presentations for is on uh, for the 14th of uh, December, and I will book this room. Sorry, do you have a final example as a structure of 14? Oh, you do. Previously, you said it's Yeah, I emailed everybody and said 14th, but can you check for now it's 14th, unless you have a, a final exam on that day? Yes? No. <laughs> <laughs> we, have, we have six. We have 670 on the December 13th. Yeah. And you have enough time to work on it. You can finish everything in the next two weeks. You don't have to wait till December to get your project done. <laughs> so the report and the presentation do on that same day. Yes. Did you post the sample report yet? I didn't see it on there. No, I should. I, w I will do it right now. I have enough time. I'll go upstairs and post this up. Any questions? <laughs> All right. Okay. We'll see you next week. Don't forget, just for 10 minutes, and then we'll see you. Uh,